I have had a number of questions recently about reflexes, but not your, your deep tendon reflexes, but the, uh, the more detailed, trickier reflexes of the brainstem. So I thought I could uh, tackle all of these reflexes individually in separate videos. I might get distracted and talk about other things along the way, but we're gonna start in this video with the corneal reflex, also known as the blink reflex, which I think we're all very familiar with, but the anatomy um, is very interesting. And looking at the anatomy of these reflexes will help you better understand cranial nerve anatomy, better understand the functions of the brainstem, and better understand how you can make use of these reflexes clinically to better understand <laughs> what's going on in your patients, all right? So, the corneal reflex. Aye, aye. Uh, the corneal reflex, or the blink reflex, the reason I say that we're very familiar with it is because the cornea is an incredibly sensitive part of the body and um, I think we're aware that it really hurts if you poke something in your eye. But it's actually quite hard to poke yourself in the eye because there are a load of um, safety mechanisms built into the body and the corneal reflex is like kind of the last line of defense maybe. If the cornea is touched, the eyelids will close. And that's the interesting bit, eyelids. If the cornea on one side is touched, see I can't do it, don't want to do it either, uh, both eyelids will close. Uh -huh. The cornea is the anterior part of the eye that is transparent and it lets light through. So the light will pass through the cornea, through the aqueous humor, through the lens and so on until it gets to the retina. Now, if it's clear, it means that it is avascular. It doesn't have any blood vessels in there because if it had blood vessels in there, it would be reddish, right? Because we know what hemoglobin's like when it grabs hold of oxygen, it likes to change its color. So the cornea gets its um, glucose, gets its oxygen from the aqueous humor, uh, the fluid within the eye deep to it, and from your tears, from the lacrimation, from the, the lacrimal fluid, from the lacrimal glands, anteriorly. And gases will diffuse across this very thin membrane. So the cornea is about half a millimeter thick, or half a millimeter thin as modern mobile phone manufacturers would describe it probably. And it's incredibly sensitive. It's, there are so many neurons in here sensitive to pain and temperature and touch, that it's about 300 to 600 times more sensitive than most parts of the skin around your body. Is this the most sensitive structure in the body? Maybe. Um, and it's then protected by that lacrimal fluid, so it's kept moist, it's very, like I say, it's a very thin structure, and it's protected by the eyelids, of course. So the cornea is the transparent part, the sclera is the white part, and you know how sensitive these are because if you get something tiny in your eye, it feels huge, it feels like you've got a pebble under your eyelid, right? It's, it, it's, it's magnified by the huge sensitivity that we have here. Um, so this is a protective function, clearly, to protect the eye that's really important to us, and it's also got some really delicate parts to it. So when you close your eyelids, you are protecting the sclera, but also you're bringing that lacrimal fluid across the sclera and there needs, uh, across the cornea, and there needs to be this constant flow of lacrimal fluid because this is how the cells of the cornea uh, get their O2, get rid of their CO2, get their glucose, get rid of their metabolites and so on, right? Remind me, what is the main sensory nerve of the head, of the face? general sensation I'm talking about here. Which cranial nerve is it? It's the trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve five. This is the major sensory nerve of the face. It's a big nerve because the skin of the face is really sensitive, your lips are super sensitive, your cornea is super sensitive, so if you have, if you have higher sensitivity, you have more neurons going to that area. More neurons mean you have a physically bigger bundle of neurons, you have a bigger nerve. So the trigeminal nerve is a big nerve. It has three major branches, ophthalmic, 
maxillary and mandibular. So the branch of the trigeminal nerve that's going to innervate the anterior eye is the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve, CNV1, right? Cranial nerve 5, first branch. Um, and to get to the anterior eye, the nerves are actually going to enter the posterior eye and then go around the eyeball, go around the eye to innervate the, the cornea, right? Hmm. It's always a little tricky to know how much detail to go into with these things, but let's go full whack, shall we? Big eye, big complicated eye model. There's the trigeminal ganglion there. This is the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve going in here. Um, and if we take away the extraocular nerves, so we think about the direction the action potentials are running in. So from the cornea and the anterior eye, we have general sensory nerves flowing around the eye. And then here are the long ciliary nerves and the short ciliary nerves carrying those sensory nerves back to the nasociliary branch of the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve. So that's the sensory limb of the corneal reflex, the afferent limb. So afferent fibers are running from a structure back towards the central nervous system. And they're running from the orbit through the superior orbital fissure to get to the brain, or the brain stem rather. And once those fibers of the trigeminal nerve have entered the cranial cavity, they get to the brain stem. Here's the brain stem here. And the big nerve around there, that's the trigeminal nerve. So the sensory fibers have got into the brain stem, and now this is where you need to use your imagination a little bit. But those sensory fibers from the cornea run to the spinal trigeminal tract and down to the spinal trigeminal nucleus. And those particular neurons meet um, interneurons of the reticular system or the reticular formation. Now in the brainstem, the reticular formation is not this ni nice neat thing you can point at. The reticular formation refers to lots of interneurons, lots of neurons connecting up lots of different parts of the brainstem for reflexes, for things like this. So the afferent information, the sensory information comes in through the trigeminal nerve, runs to the spinal trigeminal nucleus, links to some interneurons of the reticular formation, and they pass then to facial motor nuclei on both the left and the right sides of the brainstem. And then from that facial motor nucleus, these efferent neurons, so these are neurons that are carrying action potentials away from the central nervous system towards a the target. These motor neurons will then run out in the facial nerve, cranial nerve seven, and they're gonna find their way to the muscles of facial expression and one muscle of facial expression in particular. Now cranial nerve seven, the facial nerve is a tricky nerve. It has a lot going on. In this case, we have somatic motor fibers. These efferent fibers, these motor fibers are gonna innovate skeletal muscle, muscle that we're aware of, muscle that we control, skeletal muscle. And on the skull, there's the mastoid process, there's the styloid process, there's a foramen in between the two, and that is the stylomastoid foramen. And that is where this part of the facial nerve leaves the cranial cavity, and it will loop around here, uh, and run up to the, the parotid gland. Within the parotid gland, it will give off five branches, and those five branches will run to the muscles of facial expression. And in particular, orbicularis oculus is the muscle around the eye which closes the eye. So we're interested in the fibers that are running there. Orbicularis oculi, so oculi refers to, it's a plural, to both sides. So let's run through this again. The cornea in the anterior eye is covered in sensory neurons, and these sensory neurons are part of the trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve 5, and they travel back through the nasociliary nerve 
ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve, trigeminal nerve back to the brain stem, where they go to the spinal trigeminal nucleus. There are interneurons there, part of the reticular formation, which will then link the input from those specific neurons to uh, neurons in the left and right facial motor nuclei and those motor neurons are going to pass out through the left and right facial nerves, cranial nerve 7, and they will run out of the stylomastoid foramen through the parotid glands and up to here to orbicularis oculi, uh, the left one and the right one, and they will trigger the eye to close. So that's the corneal reflex. Touch the cornea, trigeminal nerve 5, reticular formation, brain stem, facial nerve, cranial nerve seven, eye closes. Simple. So what does this anatomy mean for you clinically? How can you use this knowledge? Well, if you were to get a fine wisp of cotton wool and lightly touch the cornea, you would expect both eyes to reflexively close, right? So if you were to take the right eye and put a little bit of uh, cotton wool against the cornea and neither eye closes, does that mean that the sensory limb of that reflex is not intact, so there is trigeminal nerve injury, or does it mean that the brainstem interneuron links in the reticular formation are not intact, or maybe the, the nuclei are damaged, right? So does it, if, if nothing happens, is the sensory limb damaged or is the brainstem damaged? It's a clue, right? Um, whereas if you touch the right cornea with a little wisp of cotton wool and the right eye closes but the left eye doesn't, huh, well, the sensory bit works and the brainstem bit probably works, but both sides are supposed to close. So does that mean that the motor limb on this side doesn't work? So does that mean that the left facial nerve is not intact, whereas the right facial nerve is? And likewise, if you were to touch the cornea on the right side with a little bit of cotton wool and the opposite side closes, well, does that mean that the sensory limb's intact, the brainstem is probably intact, but the facial nerve on the right side is not intact, but the facial nerve on the left side is intact. Do you see what I mean? Bit of a, lo <laughs> bit of a logic puzzle, but this is why having that basic anatomy is so important. Trigeminal nerve is sensory, facial nerve is motor in this case, the corneal reflex or the blink reflex. Okay, uh, I hope that was useful and we'll look at more uh, reflexes involving the brainstem in future weeks.